civil liberties organization based in San Francisco that does the kind of traditional civil liberties work that is to say upholding the Bill of Rights, but does it on the internet, and so does it in relation to some of the, uh, the the ways that the Bill of Rights can be can be abridged and can be exercised in the electronic realm. And I'm going to give a talk today about copyright, which is a strange thing for people who are interested in civil rights to be uh, involved with, because until fairly recently there was no nexus between copyright and civil rights. In fact, some of the worst copyright laws that we see being passed, the ones that really abridge our freedom of speech and our freedom of action, are being passed by progressive senators and uh, congressmen who have traditionally been uh, on the bulwark of defending free speech. And that's because the entertainment industry, when it needed lobbying assistance, lobbying assistance to defend its right to express itself. Uh, as we like to say sometimes, we know you guys love the first one, we just wish you'd share. Um, <laughs> there are two kinds of copyright talk. There is the kind of copyright talk you get from a lawyer, and there's the kind of copyright talk you get from everyone else, and in particular from a writer. And in particular, the big difference between the, the writer version and the lawyer version is the writer version gets a lot shoutier. Uh, and and that's, uh, with that said, um, I'm not a lawyer, I am a writer, what I'm about to tell you is my understanding of the law, and in particular my understanding of how the law impacts me as a rights holder, me as an internet citizen, and, and us as citizens of a democracy, and to tell you a little bit about how EFF is getting involved in it. So copyright in the American concession is distinct from all other kinds of copyright. It's probably uh, one of the things that this country gets right best is copyright. Most places in the world there's, there's an idea of something uh, called moral rights and copyright, you know, in France, if I sell you a painting and you hang it next to another painting and I think the juxtaposition sullies my artistic integrity, I can have a court enjoin you to change the way you come to the painting, uh, even though it's, it's changed hands because my moral right is inalienable. In America, co copyright is centered in the Constitution, it's called the Copyright Clause, as having a purpose, uh, having a policy objective. Uh, that objective is to promote the useful arts and sciences. It is nearly unique in the Constitution in having a purpose. Most of the stuff in the Constitution Bill of Rights stuff, is pretty much a priori, right? Why do we have the First Amendment? Why is there freedom of speech? Not because we want to encourage a free discourse or this or that or the other, it's because freedom of speech is sort of a priori good. And if you don't get that, you know, you're living in the wrong country. This is pretty much the framers' notion here. Um, but copyright, they sort of felt like they needed to explain why it was there, because it was a weird idea in particular. It was a weird idea that had come to some pretty unfortunate ends in the United Kingdom where they were separating from. And what they said was we needed to promote the useful arts and sciences by affording authors monopolies of limited times, and, and eventually that was interpreted as limited scope as well, or, or right in the gate was limited scope, it was clarified later, um, that allows them to exploit their works to the extent that it will give them the incentive to go on creating works. So in this conception, we have the idea of copyright belonging to authors with parts of their rights belonging to the public. There is this notion that you can't create without having a, a, a firmament to create from, a, a, a kind of raw material to make new stuff out of. And if you gave the author a perfect monopoly over his works, then you would deprive future authors of the ability to reuse some of those pieces and turn them back into, into new art. And in, in addition, you'd cycle public discourse. There is this idea that if the author has a perfect monopoly over his work, that he can tell a critic whether or not he can cite the work in criticizing it. We've never really had a regime where we said, well, criticism only comes with the sufferance of the person being criticized. Presumably that would result in lawless criticism. So if some copyright belongs to the public, and some copyright belongs to authors, and you give more copyright to authors, as we have been doing in this country for the last century, in particular in the last 40 years, we've given authors 11 new extensions to copyright, you've got to, it's got to come from somewhere. And it comes from the public. The more copyright you give to authors, the less copyright the public ends up with. And what we've done is we've fundamentally upset some of the balances of copyright, and this is how we get into some of the civil rights fights. There was recently a court case, a Supreme Court case, the Elder case, that was argued by Lawrence Lessig, who, among other things, founded the Creative Commons Project, and is one of the board members of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, and it was a case about whether or not extending copyright again and again and again met with the constitutional objectives set out in, in the copyright clause. And the court reached a lot of conclusions, some of which were very unfortunate, which was that while this may be a really dumb idea, it's not strictly speaking unconstitutional. Congress should be the ones to fix this, not the court. Um, one of the things the court did find was that 98% of the works in copyright aren't financially viable. Right? No one's making any money off of them. No one knows who they belong to. 
and no one can figure out who they belong to. Uh, this means that all of the works that were made contemporary with the time from which we started extending copyright, which was 1928, which is when this guy had his first movie, um, and we started extending copyright in order to ensure that those first movies would never go into the public domain. All of the works made contemporaneous with that are still in copyright, but 98% of them aren't owned by anyone in the first place. So in other words, 98% of Walt Disney's contemporaries' work doesn't exist anymore, can't be salvaged to the extent that we can find it, and will likely expire long before the copyright on it does. So it's kind of a slow motion burning of a library, we can see. And if we think about this as a kind of competitive exercise, what's happened is an artist from uh, 1928 has, from beyond the grave, managed to do something that he never could have done in his own day, which is to make the works of all of his competitors disappear. This is dramatically bad. Right? This is a really bad idea. And it characterizes a kind of innate human impulse that we try in our policy to uh, uh, craft outcomes against. Um, that is to say that when people climb up a ladder, their natural impulse is to pull it up behind them and dog the hatch. So Walt Disney made the first Mickey Mouse cartoons in Hollywood, California. And the reason he made the first Mickey Mouse cartoons in Hollywood, California is because that's where the film industry was. And the reason the film industry was there is because Edison controlled the film industry with his patents in New Jersey. And anyone who wanted to make a film needed Edison's permission, which he withheld and only gave out to certain people and tried to control the pricing on and so on. And so the people who wanted to make the first American films uh, got on the train and went to the ass end of California, where they would be 3,000 miles from Edison's patent agents, and they set up a pirate film industry there. Right? So Walt moved down from, from Kansas City, where he had started his business uh, as a filmmaker making movies based on Alice in Wonderland, a work that had slipped into the public domain, whose author had been alive and living memory at, 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 you know, when, when Walt started working. And he moved to California to start making Mickey Mouse cartoons. And he made Steamboat Willie, a cartoon that really broke a lot of ground. Um, it broke a lot of ground because it employed a lot of interesting new technology. One of the ways in which it didn't break ground, one of the ways in which it reflected the art of the day, is that it ripped off a bunch of other art. Um, that there are some interesting notes from Walt Disney's production uh, notebook for Steamboat Willie, in which he says, for starters, I'd like whoever makes the score for this movie to go back and have a look at the popular Buster Keaton movie, Steamboat Bill, and see if you can rip off the soundtrack such that people who are watching this know what we're referring to when we make Steamboat Willie, in case they miss the comparison. Right? That's how you get good art. Right? You take other art and you remix it. Right? That's how art comments on its culture. But there is this natural inclination to go up the ladder and pull it up behind you and dog the hatch. Traditionally, the role of technologists has been to go to the entertainment industry and drag it kicking and screaming to the money tree. So in 1908, the predominant form of entertainment in America, which was finding a talented friend who could play piano and bringing him to your living room and singing along, was being challenged by another form of entertainment, which was buying a mechanical piano and taking a digital file of the, of the music that your talented friend may have played and putting it in the piano and playing it and singing along. Um, this was back when fun was a lot less sophisticated. Um, now, the salient point about the new pianos was that the people who made the sheet music that we used to sing along to felt that they were an incredibly bad idea. They somewhat rightly saw them as challenging their ability to go on being the dominant form of entertainment in America. Not that they would go out of business, but that sheet music would become slightly less important as time went by. And then they raised a lot of artistic arguments like, what machine, soulless as it is, could ever be as expressive as a talented friend sitting here with your playing pianos? Ignoring the fact, of course, that talented friends who can play the piano don't scale well. There aren't enough of them to go around. And so what the people who made the piano roll did is they went out and they bought up sheet music and they ripped it. Right? They ripped it the same way you rip an MP3 from a CD today. They took it and they transcoded the, uh, the tablature into, uh, or the sheet music rather, into zeros and ones, holes and non-holes, in a roll of paper that would be played through a digital playback machine and then translate that into an analog signal that you could hear. And they did it without paying anyone, right? They did it without getting anyone's permission, without paying anyone. They engaged in an act of widespread commercial copyright infringement, piracy. Um, and at the time, the entertainment industry went to Congress 
and they said, we have a proposal for fixing this. For starters, we want you to ban piano rolls. Because clearly, this kind of technology has no legitimate place in the copyright expectations of the American public, right? When, where, where does it say in the Copyright Act that people are allowed to rip off our sheet music? But secondarily, we need to create an orderly marketplace. This is actually a phrase that I learned from a gentleman named Andy Cetos, who's an executive at Fox Studios, uh, who's responsible for something called Broadcast Flag, which I'll get to in a minute. An orderly marketplace for music. And the way that we will ensure that orderly marketplace is by requiring anyone who makes a new technology for playing back music to come to us and secure our permission. Right? The people who make the records should be in charge of what kind of record players can be played. And Congress told them, no. Congress told them that this is not how they're going to, uh, uh, this is not how we're going to do things. Congress actually took the important principle that would guide most of entertainment lawmaking for the rest of the century, which is that to the extent that your constituents rely on a popular form of entertainment, uh, screwing around with that entertainment is a great way to alienate your constituents. Right? Don't break the voters' televisions. <laughs> so, instead, Congress did a really interesting thing. Um, Congress decided to change copyright. They said anyone who wants to make a piano roll can give a penny to the person who sheet music they're ripping it from and get the statutory right to do it. And it turned out that that made more money for more piano roll publishers than never been created. And it turned out that that made more money for more artists than ever been dreamed of. And it made more music available to more people who enjoyed it more than we ever had. Um, it was the first instance of dragging the entertainment industry, kicking and screaming to the money tree. More importantly, it was the first time that we saw that copyright law changes with technology trends, and that it's no more fixed than, say, skirt lanes. And that every year we can expect a different copyright law to reflect new technology trends. And it didn't come down off the mountain on two stone tablets that it was created in living memory to accommodate technology innovations that we can remember happening. So it goes on. Uh, the color television was invented uh, and pushed through uh, with the uh, Federal Communications Commission as a mechanism for bootstrapping America into a new era of TV. Um, it was really hard to figure out how to do that because you don't want to break Americans' televisions because then they won't vote for you again. So what they did instead was they, they went to the uh, people who broadcast it, and they said, we demand, we require of you that in order to keep your spectrum license, you're going to have to put up apparatus for broadcasting color television. Right? And then we expect that because color television signals are available, that Americans will buy color TVs. And in fact, Americans didn't buy color TVs because they didn't know why they wanted them. Uh, and in fact, there was very little color programming on television, even though it was being broadcast in color. It was a black and white picture. So at the time, the Hollywood studios had decided en masse to boycott television. Now, they say that this wasn't collusion, right? They didn't get together in a room, apparently, and decide to do this. They independently, all of them, decided that none of them would license a movie to TV because licensing movies to TV would Napsterize the movie house. <coughs> and so, in the uh, early 50s, Walt Disney went to his brother Roy, and he said, I would like $17 million on building a theme park. And his brother Roy said, you can't have a what's a theme park. <laughs> and that began the start of a sort of 10 year falling out during which they hardly spoke to each other and the company was fissioned to, to what are still today called Roy people and Walt people. But it drove Walt to go to New York and approach ABC and offer to open the Disney vaults to them, right? To help them nasterize television, and uh, nasterize the theaters. And he, he agreed, incidentally, to do a show called The Wonderful World of Color that some of you may remember. Um, what you may not know is The Wonderful World of Color was broadcast to a country of black and white television sets. <laughs> and it consisted of sort of a half hour commercial for the happiest construction site on earth, right? <laughs> building of Disneyland, and a half hour commercial for color television, right? Come see the leaves changing in England. What a fiery tapestry of oranges and reds and yellows we see before us. Um, to a nation of black and white TVs. And it bootstrapped America into a color TV regime. And it made more money for the studios than they'd ever dreamt of. Because it turned out that new technology made more money for more creators while bringing more entertainment to more people than had ever been dreamt of. Uh, cable television came along. And the broadcasters at this point were too chummy with the, uh, with, the, uh, tele with the studios because, of course, they've been putting a lot of money into their pockets. In fact, the studio's box office picture has improved every year since 1959. Um, they haven't had a down year since 1959. 
every year since 1959 has been their best year ever. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty good business to be in, despite their, their uh, uh, poor mouthing in Congress. Um, so the, uh, the, the cable operators came along and they said, well, we've got a better way to put signals into America's living rooms. We're going to put them on a wire instead of modulating them through free space. And they built out some wireline infrastructure. And they went to the broadcasters and they said, we would like your permission to pick up your signal with an antenna and pump it out over that wire to America's living rooms. We'll figure out some kind of arrangement for paying you. And of course, the broadcaster said, yeah, pull the other one. <laughs> because the broadcasters weren't interested in licensing television material to the people who they perceived as driving them out of business. And so what the cable operators did is they stuck an antenna up anyway and engaged in a mass, uh, a, 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 a mass commercial piracy exercise in which they took some of the most expensive entertainment material ever produced <laughs> and commercially redistributed it without permission from the rights holders, taking money in exchange for the service without turning any over to it. And the Congress at the time was asked by the broadcasters to do something about this, and the Congress at the time, following the first rule of entertainment politics, decided not to break their constituents' televisions, and instead created a mandate that said that broadcasters had to license their material to cable operators at a fixed rate. And we were done. And it turned out that having more cable made more money for more television producers <laughs> while bringing more television to more households than ever before. <laughs> um, which brings us to the 80s and the VCR fight. This was back when Sony was uh, a large entertainment, uh, a large consumer electronics company that acted in, uh, like it was a large uh, uh, consumer electronics company, as opposed to a small entertainment company uh, growing on the, uh, like a boil on this giant <laughs> consumer electronics company, and the boil is leading the whole company around. Um, back then, Sony was inventing technology that it thought the marketplace wanted, uh, and it invented something called VCR, it invented the Betamax. Um, and it invented the Betamax at a time when the Hollywood studios had decided what the American living room filmic experience was going to look like. They had gone and licensed their, their balls to a company called Disco Vision which made technology that was about as good as the name Disco Vision. <laughs> <laughs> the Disco Vision played big, like 12-inch plastic discs that deteriorated after a dozen plays or so and couldn't be recorded to. Now, it's easy to understand why the studios thought that this might be a good idea to afford them a lot of control. And so Sony enters this marketplace with a VCR that you could plug into your television and grab cable or broadcast signals and stick onto a tape. And this was unquestionably a violation of copyright. Right? Copyright, among other things, is the right to control the making of copies. When I take 100% of a commercial creative work and make a copy of it to a VHS cassette, and then potentially make another copy by daisy-chaining two VCRs, I certainly violate copyright. And every copyright scholar of the day said, oh my god, you have made a pirate technology and you're going to get sued out of business. And, and what's more, you know, tough luck to you guys who are Japanese, because at the time the, the car wars were running full, full strength, and the uh, you know, Hollywood people were going to UCLA and saying, you know, the, the, the congressional hearings at UCLA in 1982, and saying, well, you know, the Japanese having destroyed the great American auto industry are now gunning for the last great American industry, the American entertainment industry, with their, with their, uh, you know, terrible disruptive VCR. So you guys are really screwed. Um, and for eight years they fought a battle to keep the VCR illegal. And it came to a pinnacle when Jack Valenti went to, before the Congress and he said that the VCR is to the American film industry as the Boston Strangler is to a woman home alone. Uh, so the Congress, again, followed the first rule, legalized the VCR. Today, 40% of Hollywood's bottom line comes from pre-recorded media, the VCR and its descendants. 26% um, comes from the box office, but the VCR has a cannibalized box office. The box office has grown every year. So in other words, the Boston Strangler almost tripled the revenue available to the studios. <laughs> Once again, we drag them kicking and screaming to the money tree. So the studios are at it again. Um, they have been making an annual report to the Senate Judiciary Com uh, Committee called the Content Protection Status Report, or CPSR. And here begins the sea of acronyms that you will drown in before my talk is over. <laughs> so the CPSR 
uh, lays out three objectives for moving forward boldly to the 21st century with a technology that gives us an orderly marketplace and preserves the rights of rights holders and so on and so on and so forth, keeps the sky from falling, makes sure the Boston Strangler doesn't come back out of his grave and strangle the entertainment industry anew and, and keeps the Japanese from destroying the American film industry again. Um, and it sets out three objectives. The first is something called the broadcast flag. The second is something called plugging the analog hole. And the third is something called stopping the avalanche of peer-to-peer. -peer. And the bulk of this talk is going to be going through what it is the studios are doing about each. So the broadcast flag seeks to address a non-existent problem. That is the problem of internet retransmission of film material on, 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 through file sharing networks. Um, it isn't that the practice of redistributing films online is non-existent. Uh, clearly, you can download films from the internet. Um, and in fact, they say that this problem is about to get a whole lot worse because we're moving to a digital television regime. It's not very likely that we will, but there's a lot of money invested in this in Congress. They, they plan on getting $80 million worth of spectrum back once Americans have adopted digital television and they shut off the analog transmitters and sell that off to the mobile carriers. And so they're willing to listen to anyone who thinks that they can convince Americans to buy digital TVs. Um, and the studios have said, uh, once we have digital television, everyone knows digits copy more easily than analogs. And, and so, uh, <laughs> once we have digital television, we're going to have a, a world of, of, of immediate, instantaneous, widespread piracy of high quality Hollywood movies broadcast over the air. And so we need a solution to this. And there are a couple of problems with this. First of all, while there are movies being distributed online, um, those movies are being distributed at resolutions significantly lower than the resolutions being uh, that, that could be delivered over uh, a digital television like, uh, like, like orders of magnitude lower. So by the time you've got a digital television signal onto the, uh, the computer and transmitted it over your favorite file sharing network, it would be indistinguishable from an analog signal. Right? It would be down -res to exactly the same kind of file we started with. And moreover, the practice of retransmitting files over the internet, while uh, problematic from a strictly legal perspective, has no measurable economic impact on the studios. In fact, as, I, as I've said, the studios are making more money than they ever have. The recording industry, say what you will about its numbers, at least can make a credible case when it goes to Congress and say, people aren't buying as many CDs. There might be a lot of explanations for it, but unquestionably, people are, are not buying as many CDs. Um, the film studio's argument is, well, people are buying more DVDs and going to more movies than ever, but that could change. <laughs> right? It's like, well, yeah, I ate my seat, mate. What if the plane had crashed? <laughs> so there's no problem. There's no problem for the foreseeable future. But we have this proposal for a broadcast flag, nevertheless, and this proposal was just passed in the Federal Communications Commission. And what the broadcast flag proposal proposes is that I, as a broadcaster, can stick into my signal a bit. And if a device checks for the bit and finds it, it knows that I, as the broadcaster, am asking the device not to allow the, the material that the bit is embedded in to be retransmitted. So imagine if, um, if this were email. I could put at the bottom of my email, please don't forward it. Well, so far, so good. But clearly, this is not a self-enforcing measure, right? If you send your email to someone who, who isn't trustworthy or is unscrupulous or for some reason or another believes that they should forward your material, the fact that it says, please don't forward it at the bottom isn't going to stop anyone from forwarding it. And so what Hollywood has proposed is that everyone who builds a device that's capable of receiving a digital television signal has to build it to detect the bit, right? It's like saying anyone who makes an email client has to build it to look for the string, please don't forward it. And when it detects the bit, to put it in a locker. And the way that it intends on accomplishing this is by, first of all, ensuring that anyone who makes a digital television receiver has to make it tamper resistant. Um, that means that if I buy a digital television receiver and I bring it home, I'm not supposed to be able to modify it. So one of the technologies that's currently in use for digital television receiving is free software, open source software, software built around the, the ethics that gave us Linux and, and other uh, uh, open source projects like Apache and so on. Um, there is no such thing as camper-resistant open source software. <laughs> Although in the FCC's decision, they said, we should figure out how to make tamper-resistant open source software. <laughs> <laughs> so presumably, given the last few people are, are sort of deep enough into, into uh, the geeky practices that you understand that tamper-resistance and open source are at some odds with them. Um, but it's worse than that, because the technologies that they anticipate mandating closed source for aren't just useful as digital television receivers. In fact, the prime technology 
is something called a software-defined radio. Some of you may remember a time when in an office you would have a word processing machine and you would have an accounting machine and you would have another machine that did something else, right? Mon monitored the, the environmental systems. And each one was a kind of special purpose computer. And then the, the PC came along. And the PC was powerful enough to do all the jobs that all the other computers did. That it could just reconfigure itself according to the principles set out when modern computer science was set up by, by Turing and von Neumann. The idea that all machines are sort of the same machine and just depends on what software you run on. And this was a pretty significant change in the way that we as a civilization interact with our environment. The idea that we could all have a universal machine that we could reconfigure to be any machine was a radical notion. Well, we're about to enter that era with radio. Right? This is the notion of a software-defined radio. So traditionally, a radio device, uh, I wonder if I have myself on the thing, it's on my jacket. Oh, no, here we go. So this radio device has an analog circuit, right? Something made by laying traces on a board and gluing things to it, right? Very sort of uh, old school arts and crafts technology. <laughs> um, and that circuit determines what frequencies I can receive and what frequencies I can transmit on. So no matter how much I want to, it's unlikely that I could turn this into an AM radio or an FM radio or a Wi-Fi card or a television receiver or a television transmitter. In a software-defined radio, you take uh, an oscilloscope, which measures electromagnetic energy, and you hook it up to an analog to digital converter, it's something that converts that signal into zeros and ones, and you make a movie out of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what you end up with, if you can visualize this, is a little sort of MPEG or QuickTime movie of a bunch of squiggles that reflect the radiant energy being passed around in the room at this moment. And you write software that goes through and it picks them up and says, that's an AM radio signal, I know how to decode that. That's an FM radio signal, and I know how to decode that. And this is cellular, and this is paging. This is Euro paging. This is Japanese paging. This is Japanese television. This is American television. This is military band radar, which really freaks them out. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, right? All radio applications subsumed into one device. And there's a free software implementation of this that currently decodes digital television. It's something called GNU Radio, uh, invented by a guy named Eric Lawson, who's an old time radio engineer, used to work on building crypto phones, now he's building. Uh, open radio systems. And Eric's business plan is basically you take uh, Moore's law, that's the law that, that says the processors get really cheap, really fast, you know, by way of illustration, uh, the singing greeting card that you pick up for 99 cents at the, uh, uh, at the Walgreens. Um, that processor has more calculations per second than all the computers on Earth put together when we launched the Sputnik. We have multiple Soviet space programs worth of computation uh, available for 99 cents in a span of about 50 years. Right? Processors get fast, fast. Right? So he takes this and he goes, well, in 10 years, given the kind of processor I expect, I can build a required, you know, cheap way for a buck or two. I think I'm going to be able to sell you a $65 device, size of a pack of cigarettes, velcro it to the back of your computer, and it is all radios. AM, FM, digital, XM, uh, Wi-Fi, WiMAX, 802.11a, 802.11g, 802.11z. Um, you name it, it's all radios. It is the protean ur radio. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty cool application. But if it's illegal to ship a device that can run a codec, that can decode digital television, if it's based on open source software, then can you read it illegal? So before we get into any of the specifics of broadcast playing, it's already apocalyptic, and the sky is indeed falling. Um, not to be too hysterical. Uh, but it goes beyond that. Uh, the broadcast flag says when I detect the bit, I have to put the stuff in the locker. And then the locker only outputs either on the analog, right? So you can still plug in a couple of RCA cables and, and output the, the signal. That's important. We'll come back to that in a second. Or on uh, protected digital outputs and protected digital uh, recording media. Um, and that protected, the list of what is protected enough is determined in the original proposal by Hollywood Studios. So you have to come to the studios and get the permission to include a technology in a digital television device. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's basically what they proposed in 1909. It was a bad idea then, and it's still a bad idea. Um, now the FCC has sort of put that question off. They've said, we're going to figure out later how to get your technology added to the list. But there will be a list, and all the technologies on it will be closed source. will have to be closed source. will have to be engineered to resist end user modification, so to, end, to resist open source drivers. And all of the technologies by the, the regulation that they're handing down have to pass what are called revocation messages. So um, I ship you a device that has six features. One of them is recording to a DVD. 
some kid in Norway figures out how to record things to a DVD, but to take them not and, and play them in anyone's DTV device, not just yours, right? Because I've decided as the rights holder that I should be able to let you record, but only record for use on your own device and not for use on other devices. And, you know, if you buy a new DTV in a couple of years, you have to throw out your library or whatever. So some smart kid in Norway figures this out. Smart kids in Norway figure this stuff out all the time. Uh, some smart kid in Norway figures this out. And if I pass a signal through some mechanism, it might be by putting it on new studio DVDs, it might be by passing it over broadcast, it might be by passing it over cable, that remotely deactivates that feature until and unless I decide to issue a package. Right? Seven features today, six features tomorrow, five features the day after. So in some sense, this is your property, but in a much more meaningful sense, this is not your property. This is property that someone 3,000 miles from you, sitting in a, a back lot in Hollywood, can reach into and break, even though it's sitting in your living room. But the mandate on technology components is far worse than the, re than the revocability. So the mandate on recording methods and output methods does a lot more to damage us as a society than the revocation. Because the revocation only affects TV devices, which, important as they are to get reelected, aren't all that important to me in the general scope of things. But it affects general purpose PCs when you start to affect things like DVD recorders and FireWire. And if all of those things need to be closed source, and if all of those things are subject to license negotiations, so I go to the studios and I say, I've invented the DVD, please include it in your digital television whitelist. And they say, we will allow you to do this, provided that anyone you license the IP to license the DVD technology to, uh, you get the following promises from it. We see this already. You know, this, this power button has a DVD drive built in there. Um, and it's a generally useful piece of technology, but it has a couple of failings. If I put a DVD in this drive, um, my uh, debugger stops working. Right? If I put a DVD in this drive, I can't shoot screenshots. If I put a DVD in this drive, there are certain kinds of windows that I can't drag from here to an external mirror, to an external display. Um, not because Apple thinks its customers want this. <laughs> None of Apple's customers, well, most of Apple's customers don't know what a debugger is. And the ones who do did not wake up this morning and say, I wish that there were more circumstances in which my debugger broke. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that these features are included, the reason that there are engineering dollars at Apple being devoted to these features, is that in order to get a license to include a DVD uh, player with the operating system, they had to agree to break their operating system in specific ways. All of the components that output or record digital media that are included in a digital television technology are going to end up under similar regimes if the broadcast light carries forward. So the FCC has ruled on this, and the FCC ruled on this despite the fact that there is no actual problem. And it's a disaster waiting to happen. And we're fighting it. Um, we're fighting it on the same grounds that we won the crypto wars. Um, if any of you have ever bought anything with a browser and seen a little lock appear in your browser bar that says that you're having a cryptographically secure conversation with a remote server, that didn't happen on its own. Um, back in the day, the uh, National Security Agency decided that giving Americans the tools to have secrets that the National Security Agency couldn't read was a, a danger to national security. Uh, they invoked what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse child pornographers, the terrorists, uh, the mafiosi, and the pirates. Right? They used strong crypto to keep secrets that were so good that no one would ever get access to them. Um, and indeed, they probably have. Right? Presumably, banning certain kinds of math wouldn't stop the mafia from exploring. Um, so we went and we fought this, this case on a lot of different merits. We, we fought for the rights of Americans to own, export, and tinker with technology for keeping good secrets. Um, and we, we, we made an economic argument, and a lot of people made economic arguments back then. We said, well, you know, other countries will build this. We want America to be the technology juggernaut. We need to uh, give Americans the best tools we can. We shouldn't we should hobble them. Um, and no one was interested in that argument. And we went and we said, the codes that you guys are giving us, the ones that you say are good enough to keep our secrets, aren't good enough. And one of our founders, a guy named John Gilmore, was a stone genius and you know, invented the, the alt news groups and founded the first Dallas ISP and was employee number six at Sun and co-invented Solaris and Sun and Sparkchip and so on. So Gilmore sat down in, in typical engineering fashion. He uh, designed a chip that would break the cipher that the NSA said was strong enough for Americans to do. And they, they had this kind of, they did the, 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 we have a hollow mountain full of mathematicians who tell us that it will take a trillion years to break the cipher. 
right? And we would say, well, we have a courtroom full of bearded hackers who say that they can do it in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and they would say, well, you know, we believe the Hollow Mountain guys, right? The Hollow Mountain guys have kept us secure. So God, Gilmer decided to infuse some facts into the discussion. So he designed something called the DES cracker. The, the, the standard was called DES, decryption, uh, defense encryption standard. And he showed that you could brute force DES in two hours. And it turned out no one was interested in that either. What carried the day, and this is pretty cool, we went out and found a mathematician, a guy named Bernstein, who had written a book that included source code for strong crypto. Right? He published source for strong crypto. And he was a mathematician who specialized in crypto. So you have a mathematician writing equations. And we went to court and we said, tell me that this guy doesn't have a First Amendment right to publish code. <laughs> Right? And the court said, you're absolutely right. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, you're absolutely right. There is a First Amendment right to publish code. Code is a form of expressive speech, which it is a lot of the time. Maybe not all the time, but a lot of the time, code is a form of expressive speech. Um, and we have been arguing that ever since with varying degrees of success. But it's an important principle. And it's the principle that we're going to take on the broadcast flag. Um, we have free software that demodulates ATSC signals, digital television signals, and we think it should be legal. And we think that the person who wrote it has a First Amendment right to publish it. And so we're going to go to bat on that. We've got a pretty good track record on it, so we can cross our fingers. So the next piece of their regulation is something called the analog hole. Um, it's not often that an organization as slick as the Hollywood Studios busts out a term of art so easily ridiculed as analog hole. <laughs> and then goes before the Congress and tells them that they need to plug it. <laughs> but they did. They have since learned their lesson. They now call it the analog redistribution problem. <laughs> or A, or P. Uh, getting back to the acronym suit. Um, you may remember that one of the things that you can do with the digital television is output clear text, right, that is to say unscrambled, unprotected signals on the analog outputs. And you need to plug an RCA cable into it and plug that back into a tuner card, a video card on your computer, and suck it in and turn it back into zeros and ones. Right? If you've got good cables with you know gold tips, you know the kind of thing that, that hi-fi nuts live and breathe, um, you will experience very little signal degradation in that little what's called a DAD operation, digital to analog to digital <coughs> operation. In fact, DVDs have several superfluous digital to analog to digital uh, 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 conversions in them by mandate because the people who control DVD technology are really paranoid about you ever getting access to an unprotected digital signal. So they sort of make the, the people who make DVD drives ping pong the signal back and forth between digital to analog converters and analog to digital converters to just futz with it and kind of confuse you. It's like a minotaur's maze or something between you and the, the signal coming off of your DVD. Um, you know, in practice, digital to analog to analog to digital conversions don't actually degrade the signal. Combine with that the fact that if I sell you any form of entertainment that's encrypted, I'm not going to get much money for it from you unless I give you some means to decrypt it. <laughs> in order for you to see some value in the DVD or CD or book that I sell you, you have to have some mechanism to render it legible. And once it's legible, it can be captured. Right? Um, we can see this in, in people who just uh, point a camera at their television. We can see this in people who just grab the line out from their from their phono record and plug it into the line in on their digit on their digitizer card and make MP3s. There's actually an amazing news group called All Binary Sound 78s era, in which hundreds and hundreds of shellac 78s are digitized in this fashion and put online. Most of which are actually in the public domain. It's a lot of them predate 1928. It's pretty cool. Um, and so they say we have an analog hole and we need to plug it because no matter how good our digital protection is. If, you can, if any smart kid can make a digital to analog to digital conversion and rip out the digital protection, we're screwed, right? It ends up on the internet, people circulate it around, we're done. They actually recognize that it's a really important point, which is that when you sell to people media that, that, that's locked in ways that they perceive as unfair, so I sell you a CD, but you can't convert it to a format that you can take to the gym on your MP3 player, because it's got rights management on it, um, what you do is you drive people to going to the network to find broken copies or cracked copies. We could actually call them fixed copies of these, of, of these songs, right? That what you do is you actually drive people into engaging in the behavior that you're seeking to stop. And they say, well, we need some way that once these people have been driven to this behavior, that we can frustrate them. 
This is this is very strange market thinking. It's kind of you know. I wish my customers would behave themselves. Um, there aren't a lot of entrepreneurs who've made a lot of money with this approach, unfortunately. Um, and so they propose that um, uh, that we will mandate the production of devices that can perform an analog to digital conversion to check for something called a watermark. And a watermark is this theoretical invention that um, is an invisible mark. Like, like you get in a you know, dollar bill or, or a foreign currency, in fact, where you hold it up to the light and you see the picture of some general uh, uh, you know, embedded in the, in the material, you know, a moose or something. Um, we'll embed a watermark in it, uh, and we will mandate watermark detection. And we're going to find watermarks that are uh, invisible, right? You won't detect them, they won't degrade the signal at all. But if you remove them, the signal will look like hell, right? Or sound like hell, right? You'll break the signal. Um, there's a signal processing expert who actually broke the first big watermark initiative, something called the Secure Digital um, uh, SDMI Secure Digital Music Initiative. Uh, a guy at Princeton named Ed Felt. Uh, Ed has a, a sort of really nice nutshell explanation of why this is really a, a strange idea from an engineering perspective, which is that um, if the watermark is undetectable, then when you ro remove it, you won't see a difference. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Straight up signal processing, you know, logic. This is this is but there are a lot of vendors out there who are convinced that they can make watermarks work. And at the end of the day, the point of these technology mandates isn't to get perfect control over what people like you and me do who are technically sophisticated. It's to make sure that certain market failures are preserved, right? My cousin who's a, a, a sophisticated in many ways, but not technically sophisticated, has two small kids. Uh, she's a stay-at-home mom, she buys them toy stores, she wants to turn the DVD into a VHS cassette so that they can put it down in the kids' room so that when it gets covered in marmalade, she can make another one and put, put that one down in the kids' room. And she goes to, to make a copy. Um, now, if you're sort of technologically savvy, you might know that there's something called macrovision that stops you doing this. And then you can defeat macrovision by getting a, a macrovision defeating DVD player or by buying a little macrovision defeater off of eBay for about 10 bucks. Right? My cousin doesn't know this. My cousin doesn't even dream about this. My cousin instead ends up buying two copies of Toy Story. And that's what this mandate protects. Right? This isn't about keeping video off the internet. This isn't about keeping honest users honest. Right? Keeping honest users honest, as Felton said, is like keeping tall people tall. <laughs> My cousin is honest as the day is long, never even nicked a candy bar. She doesn't want to make a copy of her VHS cassette or her DVD so that she can make a counterfeit box and sell it off a blanket on Broadway. Right? That's dishonest behavior. That's what real pirates are. Real pirates are people like the organized Ukrainian pirate gangs who stamp out millions of pirate DVDs and VHS cassettes and, and, and CDs every year and are involved with organized crime who you know, do slave running and drug running and so on. No, she's, she's honest, right? What this has done is not kept her honest, it's kept her in chains. There is no nexus between copy protection and keeping honest people honest. There's no nexus between copy protection and allowing legitimate activity. This is about allowing legitimate activity within the scope of some business model that has been conceived of by some studio executive, which is not how the market usually works. So they propose the analog hole uh, mandate, and they propose that, that the analog hole mandate extend to all devices that can perform analog to digital conversion. Now that's a really large universe of devices. Um, the engineers in the crowd will chuckle because they know that that includes things like seismographs and uh, CAT scanners and cell phones and so on and so on and so on. And when you when you ask them about this, when you say, "Well, do we need to protect seismographs? You know, there are no copyrighted earthquakes." <laughs> we might not need to protect seismographs, but we need to make sure that if there's an ABC for sale in the market legitimately, an analog to digital converter, that it doesn't find its way into a naughty. And so maybe we do need a mandate that extends to seismographs and so on. And in fact, there will be some fallout. So at the Analog Reconversion Discussion Group, or ARDG, which we like to call it ARG, um, <laughs> at the Analog Reconversion Discussion Group, we've heard vendor proposals that included um, uh, failure modes that were considered acceptable, like you are recording your son's first steps. He is walking through your sitting room. Um, your older son turns on the radio and cranks it way up. And there's a copyrighted song playing with a copyright watermark in it, and the copyright watermark vibrates through the air and comes into contact with the microphone, and the microphone says, "I'm being asked to be to to, to abet an act of piracy," and it shuts itself off. <laughs> and 
and it shuts down all the ADC operations in the camcorder, and your son's first steps are lost in right? That's a legitimate failure mode in the, in the vision of the analog whole. And the analog reconversion discussion group, which is the people who are writing this mandate, um, have recently finished their final report. They brought it to their Congress critters, and we're expecting some kind of mandate to uh, be proposed on this very shortly. Now, the final piece of this, the third part of this, is controlling the avalanche of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, the internet is a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, the internet is inherently a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, the internet is a network where all computers can communicate with all other computers. That's the definition of a peer-to-peer -peer network. Modulo some weird firewall stuff that's up in the last couple of years. Um, the studios don't like peer-to-peer -peer networks. In 1995, when the National Information Infrastructure hearings were being held, these were the, these were the hearings where um, uh, Al Gore, in fact, did help invent the internet as we know it today by saying, yeah, you're right, we should, we should actually fund the production of TCP IP networks that are demilitarized. Right? We should allow packet networks to be, as a matter of policy, we should allow uh, these networks to be encouraged in, in the American uh, 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 infrastructure uh, universe. Um, back then, the studios went to them and they said, we've got a better idea. You know, we've looked at this packet switching stuff, we don't like it. Because um, it doesn't, it, it allows the four horsemen of the apocalypse to ride out upon it. Right? You, can, you can pirate stuff and you can communicate it this way. The mafia will use it and so on. Now we've got a better idea. We've been looking at this AOL system. Right? And these guys have got it right. Because people can usually talk, but they can monitor all the communication. If they see something infringing, they can throw it away. Right? They just drop it on the floor. Silently discard it. Um, and they suggested this to the Congress. And the Congress sort of extended the principle of don't screw with your constituents television to don't screw with your constituents chapters. And they said, no, that, that's, that's a bad idea. We won't be doing that. Um, but the studios are back at it. They have said, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networks have broken uh, our business models. And we need to break the peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, we want the internet uh, designed in some way or, or mandated in some way that we can monitor it for infringing activity and to silently discard infringement. Um, this sounds like a weird idea. We kind of, as geeks, have, a, have a, 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 an inherent belief in the unregulatability of the internet. Uh, part of it is the kind of myth that it, it grew up as a, as a network that was meant to withstand uh, nuclear attack, and so how it possibly regulate something to withstand nuclear attack. Um, and some of it is just that, uh, you know, traditionally either the network hasn't, people haven't, uh, they've been looking the other way, they didn't notice the internet was there. Organizations like EFF and the ACLU so kept it free. Um, but as a point of fact, 70% of internet's traffic traverses U.S. soil. Most of it goes through one or two data centers, on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. And everyone who uses the internet, to some approximation of everyone, resides in a country that is a World Intellectual Property Organization signatory and has their physical corporeal being in a place that is squarely in the jurisdiction of a lawmaking body. Right? You can't make the internet go very reliably in countries that don't have electricity or wires. Right? And that's pretty much where you need to go if you want to get out from under the grip of the World Intellectual Property Organization. And so when we, when we propose an enforcement regime that binds internet users, and people say, well, if people do that, the internet will just migrate to somewhere else, um, the question we need to ask them is, where is somewhere else? Right? Countries that don't have the rule of law have a hard time capitalizing infrastructure investments in satellite launches. Right? Or, or fire switches, right? Countries that don't have you know, reliable currencies and banking have a hard time making big, ambitious infrastructure projects work and stay, right? Countries like that generally have to station people with guns along the phone lines to make sure people don't rip them up and sell them for the copper, right? So the internet is inherently regulated, and the studios are punching well above their weight in Congress today, and they keep articulating this third goal of controlling the way the internet works. Now, we just won a really important fight, and we just argued it again at the appellate division in the Ninth Circuit. Um, they argued that uh, the file sharing net networks built on Nutella, which is a fully decentralized networking architecture in which um, I employ you a tool, and you use that tool to communicate with other people, and I don't have any control over how you use it, and I don't get to monitor you or anything. They said the people who, who deploy that should be on the hook for what they're using to do. A principle that we don't have anywhere else in the world. You know, no one's no one's ever asked anyone to make a car uh, that couldn't be used to drive away from a bank job, or a crowbar that couldn't be used to break into someone else's house instead of to, to break into your own. Um, this is a really strange idea, 
we won the initial fight. We won it almost a year ago. And we just argued the, the uh, we just argued in front of the Ninth Circuit in the appeal, and we kicked ass. Um, and the court, the court was, uh, uh, thankfully, the court was, was pretty uh, skeptical of the claims of the, uh, of the studios. In fact, one of the judges, Judge, Judge uh, Noonan, um, I'm just going to read you a little quote. Uh, Judge Noonan said to the studio uh, rep, the studio lawyer, he said, let me, tell me, let me tell you what I think your problem is. You, you can use these harsh terms like piracy and theft, but you're dealing with something new. And the question is, does the statutory monopoly that Congress has given you reach out to that something new? And that's a very debatable question. You don't solve it by calling it theft. You have to show why this court should extend a statutory monopoly to cover this new thing. That is your problem. Address that if you would, and curtail the use of abusive language. <laughs> you know, it actually worked in our favor that the lawyer from the other side kept forgetting the judge's name. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually download that entire argument, which was argued yesterday uh, in, in LA. You can download that whole thing from the EFF's website if you go to there today. Um, the big danger that we face from breaking the internet through packet filtering is that we lose something called the end-to-end -end principle. And this is pretty much the end of my talk. Um, the end-to-end -end principle is, is, a, is a, an abstraction that may be hard to communicate, but is at the crux of why the internet works as well as it does. The end-to-end -end principle says very simply that any party on an end-to-end -end network can communicate with any other party without any third party intervening. It sounds very abstract. But in 1989, an English physicist working at CERN in Geneva, uh, uh, radio, uh, 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 the, the, the reactor shop in Geneva, came up with a better way of sharing data with his friends uh, and his colleagues. And he developed a client and a server and a protocol and a market language that he distributed to his peers. And they installed it and they ran it. And today we call it the World Wide Web. So today I have on my Mac, and you can have on your PC, and we can have on our Linux boxes and dedicated purpose technology, we can have something called voice over IP. Um, that's a, a mechanism for sending voice over the internet for free. I use iChat. Um, I communicate with people in England all the time. As you heard, I'm moving people on this and a lot of time talking to you about paying telcos in England for Now, these things don't run on an end-to-end -end network. They have many salient virtues, but their end-to-endness is not one of them. And what that practically speaking means that if I want to have a free conversation with you on this phone, and keep in mind, the people who make this phone and provide me with the network service make the majority of their money by overcharging on LD on long distance. I can't just install voice over IP software on this phone. I need to go to them for permission. There's a third party who intervenes with my discussing something with you. And in general, we can imagine that disruptive technologies permission will be withheld. No one likes to have their lunch eaten. When we create a network in which some kinds of traffic is legal and some kinds of traffic aren't, we bifurcate the internet into the universe of data that can traverse the network freely and the universe of data that is stopped by some rule somewhere. And the question we need to ask at that point is, who among us is capable of reliably deciding what class of information may be transmitted and which class of information should be off limits? And who among us is capable of watching that person and keeping them honest? It's a very hard question to answer. It's not one the studios have an answer to. This is being extended with something called broadcast right in Geneva at, uh, at the World Intellectual Property Organization. There's a, an ongoing treaty negotiation that I've been working on, uh, and I think that we're going to win, I hope. Um, we won the last round, and I think we'll win the next round. The, the, what's nice on the international stage these days is that uh, uh, delegates from uh, the uh, developing world are starting to understand that affording strong intellectual property uh, rights to countries that export intellectual property to you is generally a bad idea, uh, uh, at least for your own domestic policy. And so last time around, we got India and Egypt and uh, Brazil to block uh, the broadcast treaty. It might happen again. Um, this is also happening right now in bilateral trade negotiations with Latin America and in uh, the free trade of America, uh, uh, the free trade area of America's negotiation. Um, and, and treaty negotiations have become the way that a lot of this stuff is going through. It's the new, it's the new front on which this fight is opening. To the Digital Marketing Copyright Act, there are some incredibly bad provisions, something called the Anti-Circumvention Provision, that among other things has given us the spectacle of the Russian State Department advising its scientists not to come to America because we put people in jail when they say the wrong kind of equations. 
Um, <laughs> Russian <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, We had a bill on the, on the uh, we had a uh, bill circulating on the Hill to repeal this. Uh, while that bill was repeating, someone from the State Department snuck off and negotiated a treaty with, with Chile and Singapore that said that we wouldn't do it. Right? That bound us not to pass this bill. So treaty negotiations are becoming more important. So I come to the end of the talk, and the end of the talk is the what can you do part of the talk. So for starters, copyright norms follow you. Right? Copyright is a lot like Tinkerbell. You clap your hands if you believe in it, it comes to life. Um, when everyone rips piano rolls and plays them in their player pianos, uh, we decided that it's probably best to fix the piano roll system. Um, today we're trying to do this with online downloadable music. Um, downloadable music has brought back the 80% of music that was not commercially available for sale anywhere in the world, resurrected the largest library of human creativity ever assembled. Um, downloadable music, the solution to it that we've had proposed is on the one hand the iTunes store which takes that 80% and throws it away again and then compensates the labels without compensating artists. And on the other hand we have the uh, sue 70 million Americans into submission and make examples out of 12 year old girls by confiscating their college savings. Neither of these strike us as very good solutions to the file sharing wars. Uh, we have another proposal. We, we want Americans to get the same deal that the radio stations get, which is you pay a small seat fee, set fee into a kitty. Um, there's a, an anonymous statistical sampling of what's being downloaded using whatever technology you want. And then that money is broken up and paid out to artists and their labels. And the statutory minimum goes directly to the artist no matter what the deal with their label says. Right? This is what we got in the, in the last uh, uh, webcasting negotiation as well. And it's a recognition of bargaining power when you bargain for your music contract is typically pretty stilted. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of signatures in support of this. I hope that the will come and help us perform the copyright if you go to EFF.org. Uh, you'll find a, a chance to sign up for this. You can uh, join EFF. Uh, we're a member-supported charitable nonprofit. Uh, we're a 501c3. We give you a tax return. Um, being academics and students, this may not be as important consideration as this for some people, I understand. Um, nevertheless, uh, the vast majority of our funding comes from individuals who make small annual donations of $100 or so. And this is how you guys can help keep us afloat. Uh, the internet didn't get free because it's inherently free. The internet stayed free because organizations like EFF fought to keep it free. Um, and you can embrace things like Creative Commons, which is about to be my new employer. I'm about to go to work for Creative Commons in the UK. And Creative Commons is a mechanism that allows artists and other creators to specify that some rights are reserved because the expansion of copyright doesn't serve the vast majority of those. And there are some rights that we can give back to our audience. And, and you heard earlier that I've taken my novels and I've released them online with a license allowing for non-commercial redistribution. Um, this hasn't cost me a penny. Uh, it has sold more books. And it has enlisted my audience as my aides in selling and promoting my work. It's been good all the way around. I didn't do it because I'm a, there's a kind of, kind of common misconception that I did it because I'm a good-hearted slob. Uh, some kind of, you know, um, wavery, you know, patchouli scented <laughs> idealism. Uh, it's, it's about selling more books, and it's sold more books. There are scientists who are engaged in open science publishing these days. The reason that they're doing open science publishing isn't just a commitment to freedom of information. It's because it is more cost effective to give your work to the Public Library of Science and have them peer review it and then release it to the Creative Commons than it is for you to subscribe to a $50,000 journal, right? It just makes economic sense. And that's the other way that we can help reform copyright norms. You guys have been really patient, and I very much appreciate it. And thank you for listening so attentively. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. Hey, two questions. One on the A to D thing. Do they really think they're going to be able to have all A to Ds look at watermarks? Or are we going to have a, 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 a black market in un unwatermarked A to Ds? That's the first one. And the second one is, if, we're, if they're going to try and monitor the internet, would it peer-to-peer -peer go to doing like secure socket layer between them so that the cost of trying to decode all the, the packets is so great that they'd never be able to monitor it? So um, in the, the first question is, um, will they actually ever perfectly control ADC and maybe deconverge? And, and the answer is, of course not. And they don't even want to. Remember, this is about keeping honest user times. Right? This is about taking unsophisticated users and forcing them to buy things twice. Right? And they will. The collateral damage will be that all kinds of legitimate research and products will never come to light, and that people who are engaged in producing that legitimate research and products will end up on the wrong side of the law. 
right? Um, the downside won't be that it'll be impossible to acquire an ADC, right? First year engineering students, high school kids, build high speed ADCs as science fair projects, right? The problem is going to be that we're going to uh, uh, undermine civil society, right? Um, uh, the second <coughs> question was, um, when it's peer to peer networks. Well, peer to peer networks go crypto. Yeah. Um, maybe. <coughs> Uh, maybe peer-to-peer -peer networks will go crypto, uh, but uh, we've seen in China, for example, where they have network monitoring, there's something called the Great Firewall. Um, <laughs> 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 it fairly reliably determines who's looking at naughty things in China. Not perfectly, but fairly reliably. We have people distributing applications into China, like Freenet and Peekabooty and Triangle and so on, the hacktivist applications that allow people to communicate in secret. And what we find is that the Chinese don't need to know what you're downloading to know that you're downloading something naughty. All they have to do is notice that you're the only one downloading in secret. <laughs> right? Everyone else is communicating in the clear. What's so special about you? Here's a question in the back. Yeah, as you went through the history of copyright, I was struck by the, the difference in the, the business world in America around each time period. I'd argue that today we're an entertainment society. That's why Hollywood has so much sway in Congress. What's going to make that change? I don't know that we are an entertainment society. I mean, Americans used to go to movies a lot. I mean, a lot. Uh, uh, and Americans used to do all kinds of different entertainment, depending on, on the era. Uh, I tend to believe that the reason that the studios punch well above their weight in Congress, and that the, uh, the uh, industry punches well below its weight in Congress, is because the studio has been fighting this stuff First of all, on a freedom of expression basis for as long as they've existed. And they've been fighting the copyright stuff since 1909. Um, and so they've got a lot of practice. Whereas tech tends to come under the umbrella of military spending. Right? Tech grew up out of defense spending. San Francisco is a tech center because it was a great place to build ships. Right? And so you had radio engineers, and then you had Stanford, and then you had, you know, uh, uh, the, then you had Silicon Valley. Um, and as a result, we kind of got stunted in terms of its, its lobbying cloud. Right? It never really figured out how to lobby for itself. For its and, and, it, it, and it ended up, um, when the generals went away, who could go and just sort of request budgets, right? without a lot of congressional oversight, without having to lobby very hard, that the studios or the, the technology companies really found themselves out in the cold. Um, increasingly, lobbyists are hiring, or, or technology companies are hiring sophisticated lobbyists on the Hill, more and more of them. Um, and increasingly, consumer rights groups, I don't like the term consumer, but I don't know what else to call them consumer rights groups are popping up on the Hill and elsewhere that work to uh, not rely on the, the electronics companies and the IT companies to be their proxy anymore, right? We won the, the VCR not because uh, a curb or another consumer group stood up, right? We won the VCR because Sony did. And Sony was, at the time, a good proxy for our interests. Um, today, the consumer electronics companies in the main follow Sony, and Sony follows its entertainment business. And then the, today, the IT companies in the main follow Intel, and Intel's in bed with the entertainment companies. Intel ran the broadcast play. <laughs> so, uh, and, and you know, Microsoft is in this, and Apple is in this. I mean, all of these companies are trying to get access to material for their platform, you know, their content for their platform that they can distribute as a way of selling more semiconductors, and they're willing to break their business in fundamental ways to do it. Um, I would hope for competitors to come up and say, well, I'll sell you unbroken technology. But increasingly, as this stuff is governed by mandates, you don't get competitors, right? There hasn't been a new feature introduced to the DVD in 10 years, because you can't make a DVD player without a license from the studios. Right? The last one that, that was introduced was a, someone finally shipped a hard drive-based DVD jukebox. It was a thing that holds 30 DVDs worth of movies without having to have them actually sitting in a, in a, on spindles. And um, this is something that I could build, you know, out of a box <coughs> in a couple of hard drives for like 1,200 bucks. Selling for thirty thousand dollars. That's the that's the cost to innovation of, of the technology mandate. Um, so I think consumer groups are where it's at, and I think lawmakers are finally starting to wise up. I think that the recording industry's litigation campaign started to wake lawmakers up to this stuff. Um, you know, again, it, it baffles me how a company, an organization, an industry as media savvy as the recording industry companies are could possibly go and take away the life savings of a 12-year-old honor roll student from a housing project in New York who downloaded TV theme songs. I mean, this is just, you know, such astonishingly dumb behavior that, you know, it really did arouse the ire, genuine ire, 
of lawmakers who stepped up to the plate. And we try to, we try to uh, reward them if we can. If you get on the EFS mailing list, uh, the effective, you'll get weekly uh, updates. One of the things that we do is something called an action summary. When you punch in your zip code, it tells you who your Congress members are. And it has letters you can send to them. You can adapt them to your heart's intent. In fact, we don't stop you from changing them around so they say the reverse, right? Don't listen to anything the EFS says. You actually have people send them. So we don't care. Popular speech never needs to defend the First Amendment. It's absolutely. Um, and um, one, of, one of the regular campaigns we'll do is when someone like Senator Cohen stands up and says the right thing about the recording industry, we get tens of thousands of Americans to write in and tell them, you go north. Um, lawmakers need campaign funding to get reelected, but they need votes too. And people do make a difference. So I think that that ultimately is the way that we'll fix this. Yes, sir. Do you think that as a music industry, it's essentially that uh, it's basically over, that the, the indie content, the content that's not, not necessarily copyrighted is being distributed better, and in essence, marketing itself better, and it's going to overthrow. In other words, it's only a matter of time that all these uh, large uh, inner sort of networks go away. So the question is, well, will indie content, because it's connected with uh, or embracing file sharing, uh, outcompete the labels? It may, but I'm very wary of the position that says um, if you listen to, if you buy material from the mainstream, you know, watch the television, go to the movies, listen to the radio, buy a CD, you are uh, not, you are, you are betraying <coughs> the cause. Because I think at the end of the day, the popular revolution requires that its adherents issue popular entertainment, it won't be popular. Right? Um, and honestly, I don't want to get into a position where I have to say, um, well, this art is bad art and this art is good art. So this art will survive and this art won't. Um, I, I, I have at least enough perspective to think that you know, everything that, that starts off as bad art, I, I, lots of stuff that starts off as bad art is, in hindsight, not nearly as bad as you thought it was. I, mean, I went through the 70s saying, Disco sucks, and I have hours and hours of George Clinton on my hard drive. Right? Um, you know, the, the, it's, 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 it's easy to mistake stuff that's bad for stuff that's good. And I really hope we get to an answer that doesn't involve flushing some giant chunk of what matters to us as a culture down the toilet. Uh, I hope we get to an answer that allows people to share and compensate artists and allows the networks to flourish and reopens uh, investment and innovation in networks. Yeah. Speaking of public compensation, um, I heard that you're not taking PayPal donations for your online downloads. Yeah. So I'm not taking PayPal donations for my online downloads. Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Um, on the one hand, I think it's I, I, it sets up it sets up a universe where one of the questions that everyone first asks you is how many donations have you got? What's the total sum of your donations? Um, and if that number turns out not to be very big, it's, it, it doesn't do the cause any good. On the other hand, um, I don't want to compete with my publisher. Um, publishing is not the act of running a book off the of press. That's printing. Publishing means to make public. And my publisher is good at making things public. I mean, I got my book on Slashdot, my publisher got my book in the New York Times. They are complementary activities. <laughs> <laughs> Slashdot is good, don't get me wrong. I mean, being, being savage by the Slashdorks once a week is actually pretty good. <laughs> you keeping your ego in check, if nothing else. Um, but the New York Times sells books too. And I don't see why it has to be neither of a proposition. And at the end of the day, when I sell more books, I put more money in my pocket. Um, and, and likewise, when I distribute more books, I raise my profile for things like wired assignments. And for, I mean, you know, I sold my first novel down in the Magic Kingdom. I got the advance check. The same day I turned in a, a really short wired article called Eastern Standard Trust, the same title as my book, was about the same idea. Um, I had written 1,500 words in the final run. It got cut to three paragraphs. Um, the check I got for it was as large as the advance check. For down at the Magic Kingdom. Raising my profile gets me more of those assignments that pay really well. You know, um, uh, I know writers who, at least during the peak of the boom, were getting 20 grand to fly first class to Hawaii and spend an hour talking to a game developers conference and then spend the rest of the time lolling around a sauna. Um, you know, these are these are legitimate ways of making business to make a living that have no competition with my publisher that, that align my interests with those of my publisher. My publisher does a bunch of stuff that I can't do. And I do a bunch of stuff my publisher did. Um, 
And I think that there's a role for publishers in uh, at least at least some of them. And so that's what I'm sort of hoping to, uh, to preserve by not taking pick up. And then finally, grumbling for nickel sucks. Right? <laughs> Keep the dollar, right? I mean, <coughs> so on the one hand, when you tip the person at the coffee shop a dollar, and they say, that's cool. But when you get a little notice that says, someone has paypal you a quarter, and you write a thank you note, it seems somehow stilted. Maybe someday we'll have a social norm that encompasses this that doesn't feel really weird, like alms for the artist, alms for the artist. But today, it's like a thousand petty humiliations. <laughs> I haven't really been able to follow it much, but uh, I guess I hear if I write something that I believe is called palladium. Uh -huh. It had something to do with digital rights management, and it was going to essentially prevent, for example, um, Intel, Apple, all, all, of the, all of them on Microsoft, which is going to prevent, like, let's say if you had a, if your software was, according to, was Palladium certified and your motherboard was not, you would not be able to get the OS to install using that motherboard. Does that sound familiar? That's, that's, that's not quite right. And in some, in some, re this is a really complicated subject, not least because they keep changing the parameters of technology. There were three or four different consortia, now they've been combined into one, but Microsoft is still pursuing its own approach. They changed the name to uh, Next Generation Secure Computing Base, or INSCO, and, 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 you know, and so on and so on and so on. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do something fairly high level. We have a really good white paper that actually explains the genuine dangers of, of trusted computing, uh, which is what this whole field is called. And what trusted computing is about is keeping you from telling lies to software. And generally speaking, we think that that's a good idea, right? Generally speaking, we think that software shouldn't tell lies to us, we shouldn't tell lies to software. Uh, we would like, for example, to know that when a password prompt comes up on the screen and we enter our password, it's like passing that password straight to the application that asked for it without writing it to the hardware or sending it off to software. It makes perfect sense. The problem is that trusted computing, as conceived of by, by studios and by the, the, the semiconductor companies, doesn't allow you to control when you can lie and lying has an honorable history in computing. So when I bring up a terminal, actually this version of the terminal doesn't do it. When I bring up a terminal, most of the time, it says TTY on top. It says TTY because my computer thinks that it's talking to a teletype, right? Um, back in the old days, there was, someone wrote some code to talk to a teletype, right? Someone wrote a terminal, an interactive terminal that runs on a screen instead of on a teletype machine. Right, which is to say like a daisy wheel printer and a big placky keyboard. But rather than write new code, they just lied to the, to the process and said, I'm a teletype. Right? And we were able to introduce compatibility into it. Um, as, a, as a kind of building on, advancing the art, tell us that this, this ability to lie, we call it compatibility layers, right? It's, 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 it's got a real long honorable history. More to the point though, in terms of competitive action and anti-competitive action, right now I go to my bank's website, Canadian bank, TD Trust. And uh, at least for a while, they were hitting me up with something that says, you are not using Microsoft Explorer, you may not access our site. We don't believe that the other browsers are secure. Um, <laughs> irony. Um, <laughs> but I was able to tell Mozilla, which is a free software browser that I use, to tell my bank that it was Explorer. Right? I could tell a lie. Right? That was my decision. I got to decide when my computer told the truth and when it lied. And there's something built into uh, trusted computing called remote attestation, where one party can ask another party to accurately report on its operating state. Right? What application are you, what operating system are you, what kernel are you, and so on. Um, and the operator of the computer has two choices. They can refuse to send that information or they can send a truthful and full disclosure. But you don't get the option of saying, I know you want Explorer and, okay, I'm Explorer. Now shut up, right? Um, you don't get that option. And so what this means is that the ability, for example, for me to um, take a proprietary database that I've been locked into by a vendor and go and hire Ross Perot's company, which made a fortune doing this, to write a little script that pretends to be the client for the database and ask for the first record and writes it to a text file and ask for the second record and writes it to a text file and so on. And in that way, grabs all of my data and puts it to my hard drive in a format that I can import into something else and gets me out of the vendor lock-in and keeps this market failure from occurring where the vendors get to charge whatever they want because you're locked into them and they own all your data even though it's your data. Now, 
the server can reliably detect whether or not the client that's talking to it is uh, a, a, uh, the client that it thinks it is or a different client masquerading. We propose at EFF not that trusted computing should go away because trusted computing adds new features that are genuinely useful to the computer, like the ability to determine when your operating system is being tampered with, like the ability to trust whether or not uh, some remote computing code is running the way that, that you expect it to, and so on. But we propose something called an owner override. Um, part of trusted computing specification is a hardware channel to the keyboard that is uh, cryptographically secure. We would like a big red button added to the keyboard. When you press the big red button, you get to say whatever you want about how your computer works. And that integrates with some piece of software. So if you are sitting in front of your computer and uh, you want to make a false attestation, you press the red button. You can only press the red button if you're sitting on your computer. You can determine whether it's coming off the keyboard or whether it's a spoof signal because we have this cryptographically secure channel. And then you get to choose when you tell the truth when you don't. And we think that this gives us all the new features of trusted computing without any of the downsides of trusted so far, the semiconductor vendors have said, so the semiconductor vendors and the other people working on this, when we say, this is bad stuff because it's going to just enable digital rights management, they say, well, it's not about digital rights management. It's about stopping viruses. And we say, well, OK, how about an override? And they say, why do you hate digital rights management? <laughs> <laughs> because really, the only application this breaks is digital rights management. So it's a hard, complex technical issue. But the, the technical place to put their feet to the fire is on their override. Uh, you, know, you can read the white paper. Are there any other questions? Should we sign some books maybe? Or? Yeah, I think those will help to do it. Excellent. Uh,